So welcome everyone to the um, OERC um, seminar series. Um, so today we're, we're lucky to have um, Jens Gruger um, talking to us. So Jens is um, spending a year, I mm -hmm. think, in, in Dunedin. So he's, he comes from the OCO Institute, which I hope you'll tell us more about. But um, the, the way I understand it is it's a bit of a, a think tank on sustainability um, in Germany. And um, <laughs> is that a good description? <laughs> yeah, the, the word think tank was invented later than the right. oh, okay. was founded. So. Okay. Okay. so, um yeah, so he's going to tell us a bit about his the research he's done, and he's he does research over a wide um, area. Um, so we thought this was a good and time to, to introduce um, his work to you. So if you you know if you're interested in in collaborations or or um, something after afterwards, please we could welcome with you to talk to more about it, so. Sure. Um, Thank you very much. Over to you. Yeah, my name is Jens, uh, coming from Germany, spending one uh, year in Dunedin, uh, just to have some uh, scientific uh, exchange, but also a cultural exchange, and this is why I really uh, iron this shirt and <laughs> to this one, just that you see how uh, we <laughs> in Europe uh, are, are used to have our, our um, seminars, our presentations. Um, uh, the Eco Institute, Eco uh, means is the shortcut uh, of uh, ecological, so it's an institute for ecological things. Um, and I will uh, give you a short introduction into what is Eco Institute doing in general. Uh, and then uh, as a title of my presentation uh, was I want to show you uh, about sustainable products, what uh, we can do to, uh, to uh, improve the market or to bring better products on the market with the several uh, several policy instruments, eco-design, energy labeling, eco-label, screen public procurement. Um, and uh, in the next step, I want to show you the methodology, how to find out which products uh, are better than others uh, or where the weak points uh, on the production process might be. And after all, I would like if uh, we could discuss about uh, probably what can be um, uh, somehow adopted or, or made equally uh, in, in, in New Zealand, probably in the New Zealand public procurement or in the New Zealand uh, consumer information. Um, short introduction to Eco Institute. The Institute um, says of itself that it's a leading uh, European research and consultancy institute uh, working for a sustainable future. Um, uh, this, uh, this is why they say it is because they are really founded quite a long time ago in 1977 and they have been working on very lots of projects and in fact they have uh, uh, have driven also the uh, politics in a certain direction over all these years and uh, some things as uh, the energy uh, transition which is called in German Energiewende uh, was actually invented by Öko Institute and now it is adopted uh, in Germany but also all over the world as an energy uh, transition where everybody knows that we have to go carbon uh, reduce or carbon free and get rid of nuclear power plants. Um, uh, Eco Institute is founded as a non-profit uh, organization and actually it was founded in a struggle against the plan of building a nuclear power plant. Uh, and uh, the scientists found that there is no really independent knowledge about nuclear safety. There are certain uh, companies that uh, build these plants and say everything is fine. And there are also universities that uh, get their uh, money from the, from the government and they uh, did not, at least in these former times, uh, did not have any um, really independent opinion about them. Um, uh, we have offices in Freiburg, Darmstadt and Berlin uh, and uh, act Originally, it was founded as an uh, association with members, and everybody that pays money to the Eco Institute uh, is also tax reducible or can get his spending um, uh, reduced in his taxes. 
um, but actually the most uh, projects uh, that we are doing, uh, we're doing for public authorities like the European Union, national and state level ministries, uh, but uh, also sometimes for companies and also uh, not so um, seldom also for non-governmental organizations because the constitute is somehow known as um, the state independent but also non-profit organization which uh, if we make a study for a certain uh, topic um, yeah every or at least uh, everybody hopes it's not being influenced by any of these parties um, we work on the basis of interdisciplinary research. Uh, this is quite interesting also for me. If I want to make a project, uh, I'm an engineer for energy and uh, process engineering, but I can collect the different colleagues from the law department or from the, the toxicology uh, specialists and uh, all these people from different, uh, different uh, fields. Um, and uh, like this, we develop key methodologies and make advices to decision makers. And we complete every year uh, 380 different projects, starting from really small ones, only one, uh, one week uh, advising somebody, but also long projects uh, that last uh, three years or more. We have five research divisions, uh, energy and climate protection for sure. Uh, nuclear uh, engineering facility safety, uh, resources and transport, environment uh, law and governance. And the division I'm coming from is the sustainable products and material flows. And uh, we do projects uh, somehow related uh, to products, such as um, clean production or technology development or um, assessing of technologies um, uh, and some methods uh, are, for example, the life cycle assessment that looks uh, at a product uh, from the, to its all, all over the life cycles from the raw material um, taken from the landscape to the production, to the transport, to the use, to the disposal of products. And also one instrument called product sustainability assessment uh, where I have uh, two slides, I think I'll show you later on. So this should be a brief um, information about Eco Institute that you have a little bit of background where I'm coming from. Uh, there are further information to be found here. Um, now I want to show you what uh, different uh, methodologies or different different uh, policies can be made to improve uh, the market of sustainable products. And I'll start with this um, with this diagram, which uh, is quite. Uh, I need to explain this, and it's getting more complicated if I press the button. First of all, uh, this is the, the range of sustainability. Here are the more sustainable products, here are the less sustainable products. Um, and uh, on the market, the number of products on the market, there are quite a lot of products in this uh, medium range. Uh, but there are also, um, but there are very few products that uh, are very sustainable. And there are little products uh, that uh, are under a certain uh, range of sustainability. And this has a reason um, because there have been uh, environmental laws, such, I wrote it down here, the restriction of hazardous substances in electronic equipment, ROSE, or the ALV, ELV, and of uh, life vehicle directive. Or reach. These are all the European uh, directives, uh, registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of, uh, of uh, chemicals. Uh, so there are certain regulations that cut off the less sustainable products. Uh, products may not be sold beneath that level. Um, but as I'm talking about um, energy efficiency today, I, I will more talk about eco-design which is an instrument um, implemented in the uh, uh, European Union uh, where a certain level of, let's say, energy consumption or uh, efficiency of a product 
has to be fulfilled before it may be sold in the European market. So this is also quite a sharp knife to cut off the less sustainable products. Uh, what we want to, uh, to reach is that we want to push these core into the direction of more sustainable. And there are certain uh, instruments already uh, existing, like the one um, I'll be showing right now, to transform the market to, towards more sustainability. And one instrument is energy labeling. I'll show you details about energy labeling soon. And the other uh, instrument are eco-label. Uh, energy labeling shows uh, the whole range of products uh, and puts an energy label on it so the consumer can decide whether he wants to buy an efficient product or a less efficient product. Uh, but eco-label, on the other hand, uh, show only the most efficient or the most, mo most uh, sustainable products. Um, meaning that uh, this instrument in the middle um, tries to improve the market uh, due to competition. And this one uh, shows which are the best products and gives the better products a uh, certain um, yeah, uh, advertisement for them. Um, Last thing is promoting eco-innovations to go even beyond this last point of sustainable products. Uh, and one instrument is green public procurement. Uh, the uh, public um, authorities like ministries, but also universities or uh, councils or anything, they're spending quite a lot of money uh, to buy things. And they can uh, either look for uh, eco-labeled products, so for products that are very efficient or very green, uh, or they even can go further and ask for products that are not already um, maybe economically um, brought to the market. They say we want to have recycled conquer, or we want to have some uh, um, compostable, um, whatever uh, bins uh, that they're using to plant trees. And these products do not really exist on the market yet. But uh, when they say we will uh, buy uh, 10,000 of these items of you, then companies are interested in producing it. Um, yeah, this is the idea, just to push the market into the more, uh, more sustainable market. Uh, Eco-design directive uh, is an instrument uh, that was um, brought onto the uh, European uh, legislation market uh, for uh, quite a lot of different products, starting at air conditioners, battery charges, boilers, central heating products, and so on. Uh, and uh, each product was, uh, there were always scientific uh, assessments uh, before to find out um, what, uh, what is possible with products and what is already um, technology from the past. And so there are set um, uh, thresholds or minimum standards uh, to these products. And I'll show on the next slide uh, what happened uh, to these products. First is that they introduced the scale of energy efficiency to products like washing machines, refrigerators, um, dishwashers, uh, dryers, uh, lamps, uh, lights, uh, this is an oven, uh, and so on, uh, vacuum cleaner. They introduced this, um, this scale or this a method to name the energy consumption of these products. And after that, they uh, scheduled a, a time after products may no more be sold on the market. And what you see here shaded uh, are the products that are forbidden uh, in the year 2014. It, uh, it uh, goes on, so there are also other products, but it gets sharper after a while, but I, I actually didn't find a, uh, a picture that shows it as beautiful as here. 
So these products, these washing machines, were first labeled uh, with D to A triple plus. And uh, in the year of 2014, they said uh, these machines may no more be sold, but only these machines. And there are two things uh, that are happening. The one is in the, in the um, shops themselves. People look on this label or look at the energy scale and decide for the uh, more efficient products. And the other thing is that the companies know that they have to improve their product, that they have to hurry to get them better. Um, because after certain years, uh, they will not be able to sell these products. Um, the second uh, thing are energy label, and this is quite closely linked to this uh, eco design uh, requirement for products that they introduced uh, energy labels uh, for most of these products. And I, I uh, took here a quite complicated one to explain uh, that it's not only the energy that is being shown or the efficiency that is being shown, but also others in other information. And the interesting thing is as soon as you want to sell a product, you have to put this energy label, uh, op op you're obliged to put it on. Um, so uh, also if you're selling it over the internet, you have to put this label on. And I put here the label of an air conditioner, which is what you call here heat pumps or reversible heat pumps that can, <laughs> that can heat the rooms, but also cool down the rooms. Uh, and uh, so this label has an efficiency scale for the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, uh, which is the ratio for the cooling mode and also the seasonal coefficient of performance, which is the heating mode. And uh, here you have to tell uh, where your product is, uh, on which uh, number or which, which um, a, a scale or color, but you also have to tell how much uh, energy it is consuming every year, um, what is the electrical power uh, consumption in kilowatt, but also the heat, uh, also the, the noise levels um, from the indoor unit and from the outdoor unit. So if I go to the shop, uh, uh, I can look for an uh, energy efficient uh, appliance, but I also can look for a silent appliance or one that is silent uh, to the neighbors, probably. This is also a little complicated because it has this seasonal energy efficiency uh, ratio, uh, which is a certain use profile because uh, probably in uh, hotter countries you have to. Uh, cool much more than in colder countries where you have to heat much more. And so uh, you have to decide whether you're more likely to heat with it or to, to cool with it, or you have to decide uh, what is your, uh, your actual um, uh, seasonal coefficient of performance depending on uh, where you're living or how often you are using it. Well, this is quite complicated, but there are more easy, easier labels that probably consumers will understand better. Uh, next thing is eco-label. Um, I told you in, the, in the, this complicated diagram that eco-label are to, let's see again, this is push and this is pull, to pull the market into the direction of more sustainable products. Uh, eco labels, at least these type one eco labels that I'm talking about, are voluntary uh, on these products. So only if you have a very good product, you can can stick it on, and uh, they are awarded for uh, uh, above average environmental friendly sustainable products. Um, meaning uh, there is no would no no use, it would make no sense to put an eco-label on every product that is on the market. It only makes sense if it shows the, the top uh, products. And one thing is also important at this type one eco-label that it's uh, open for any interested applicant. So it's no label uh, such on my computer there was a label green IT something but this was a label that was invented by Intel themselves. Uh, so <laughs> nobody else can use it and nobody else can show that his computer has the same characteristics, but this 
equal label as independent of the company. Uh, there has to be a transparent process of criteria development, um, uh, and uh, I will show you our methodology that we are using uh, for that. Um, and uh, this label may not only look for one a single point, such free of some uh, hazardous substances. We see a lot of products in the stores that say we're free of cancer, anything substance. Uh, and, but nobody knows that these substances are uh, prohibited since 10 years, and so it doesn't make any sense to write it on the program. Um, and uh, there has to be proof of independent test institutes. And uh, the last point is also quite interesting, that the award of the label has to be done by a third party and not by the one that invents the criteria by themselves. Because, uh, for example, I'm uh, inventing or, or figuring out this criteria. Uh, and if I know that there are lots of companies that would take the label if I lower the, the um, thresholds, uh, then I would have an advantage in making low standards. Uh, if I would be the same person that gets money uh, from, the, from the one who takes it. So there are several criteria what a good eco label, a type one. A type one means that it's according to this named ISO standard here, uh, which says uh, what, what are the uh, minimum quality standards to this kind of label. Um, one example of an eco label is the German Blue Angel. Probably you have seen other eco labels before, especially this one, Environmental Choice, which is the New Zealand eco label. Uh, the New Zealand eco label, I think, is not uh, quite as popular, especially because it's not a governmental label but a private institution. But this fulfills the criteria I've shown before. Um, Blue Angel was introduced or, or founded in uh, 1978. Um, the logo, the same logo from the uh, UN, um, I, what is that? United Nations in, I don't know, some UN institution uh, had this logo and they landed it actually for the Blue Angel. Um, the German consumers do know that uh, label, uh, 80%, uh, but uh, at least uh, in the surveys, uh, seven, uh, only 40% say they, they um, decide uh, on this label. Probably this is what they say in the surveys, uh, but at least they know that this is the right answer. <laughs> There are more than 120 products and uh, services labeled with Blue Angel or product groups and altogether 14,000 different products, 1,000 companies. Um, and there are some, uh, some product groups that have even an uh, international um, realization or, or also on the international markets as on printers. We got here one printer. And uh, I, I would have to turn it around. Maybe there, uh, there is a good offer, uh, the good chance that there would be a blue angel on it because the blue angel is the only one, um, except for the energy star that sets criteria for printer, multifunction devices, and so on. Um, yeah, this is uh, energy labeling. I will continue with green public procurement. Um, the idea about green public procurement is that public authorities uh, purchase goods, services, and works with a reduced environmental impact throughout the whole life cycle of these products um, compared to other goods and services. Um, and uh, this is quite, uh, quite an interesting thing, a green public procurement. Uh, because uh, a considerable amount of money uh, in Germany, for example, 20% of the national gross domestic product, so the national money that is being turned around, uh, are being spent by public institutions. And so they have quite a good uh, possibility uh, to buy better products. 
And so green public procurement can drive the market to greener products and services. Uh, it has a, a important contribution and often it has also um, economic advantages to buy the greener products. And this is what we uh, calculated for the uh, state of Berlin, the town. And, uh, I don't know how you would call this uh, the government of Berlin. We're divided in, in Germany into several states and Berlin is as well a city but also a state. And we looked uh, on 15 different products and uh, how many tons of carbon dioxide uh, can be uh, saved by purchasing these greener products. And uh, this scale is logarithmic. This is why they're looking quite similar, but this is only 30, while this is uh, 230,000. Um, so in fact, these four are the, the most important products, which is street lightning, commercial waste, uh, buildings, and uh, green electricity. Um, but anyway, uh, Berlin is able to save uh, 355,000 tons of carbon dioxide every year uh, when purchasing green products. And in Berlin, they uh, actually have introduced a law that says uh, if you're purchasing products that cost more than 10,000 euro, you have to uh, uh, you have to look for these uh, green criteria at these products. So they are obliged to buy green. Um, in in practice, I'm not sure if they're really always looking for the most. Um, uh, most green products, but sometimes they are also used to buy this kind of machines since it lasts 10 years and they will keep on buying it. Or cars. They say, I want to have a BMW and I don't know how much it consumes. Anyway, the interesting thing is that we also looked about the cost uh, savings in Berlin and we found that all these uh, blue products uh, which starts at building street lightning, office lightning, computer paper, floor covering, cars and printers. Uh, they actually save money if you buy the greener products. We calculated uh, the price for buying them, but also the energy costs, for example, and we calculated it over the lifetime of the products. And we see at all these products, especially buildings, they probably will cost maybe 20% more to, to insulate them better and so on, but you'll save a lot of money. Uh, there are some products uh, where you have uh, to, to spend more money for green products, but especially as we see at the electricity, this is the most expensive one. Uh, this was also, if you go back to the last slide, the one where you can save uh, most energy if you get your electricity from your renewable energies instead of the coal plants. So it's worth to spend this money and if you calculate it together, your overall savings still uh, 38 million euros only at these 15 products. We haven't looked at, at all the products that are being purchased in Berlin, but anyway, uh, there is no um, no way to say, oh, it's too complicated and too, too, uh, too expensive to buy greener product. It's a win uh, on both sides for the environment and also for the, for the money of the, of the state. So um, to decide which are the greener products or which should be uh, pushed better into the market, uh, there has to be assessment of the sustainability of products. And I will give a very short um, uh, introduction in the way how we are doing it. Uh, we have uh, established an instrument called Sustainability Assessment uh, with PROSA, which means Product Sustainability Assessment. Um, and uh, we developed this uh, method because uh, either governmental institutions, but also companies came to us and said they want to improve our uh, production somehow tell us where to start with and the interesting uh, at Prosa it is that it looks at the whole life cycle of products so the raw material um, 
if you take it from the uh, environmental raw material, you make steel or aluminum or whatever out of it. And after that, you make products out of it. And we look at the whole life cycle. And uh, like this, um, we also find the, the uh, weak points, the vulnerability uh, where uh, products may be improved. Or on the other hand, where products that are being produced better or that uh, are more energy efficient, for example, uh, where their most impact is. Um, ROSA can be applied as a method kit uh, with different methods. Uh, I will show the different methods on, on this slide and you can choose uh, which one seems to be more important for your certain case. Um, I, I don't want to go too much into detail, but the interesting thing is that you've got different methodologies that are already well known, such, such, uh, such as um, life cycle assessment, uh, life cycle costing and benefit analysis. And depending on your question, you can, uh, can make more afford in any of these, uh, these single methods. And after all, to assemble all this information and to have a strategy development, in the case of the development of uh, eco-label criteria, for example, we derived the reward criteria for, uh, for the products. We had stakeholder discussions with the manufacturers, but also with um, governmental organizations and uh, scientists about these uh, criteria. And after all, we passed uh, these criteria to the, um, it's called, um, environmental no, environmental label jury, which is an independent commission that decides about this uh, criteria. Uh, these uh, POSA sub-methods are, uh, as I mentioned, the analysis of uh, benefit and utility of a product. Uh, this is also interesting because uh, if you look at the product, let's say you look at a car, you have also so to think uh, what's really the use of the car. You want to be transported from place one to place B, and maybe there are other possibilities like taking the bus or the bicycle but to have the same use with the product. Um, life cycle assessment is, is a standardized uh, methodology where you get the, the environmental impacts of a product, and you really can compare, for example, the cumulative primary energy demand of a product of the global warming potential. Uh, and we currently uh, also looked at the abiotic resource depletion potential of product, meaning the raw material input you need to, to produce a product, and then you can um, compare products. Well, you will always find out if comparing products that there is no black and white. It's just a light gray or a dark gray, or you can decide <laughs> whether you want to poison the water or the fishes or the, the air, and you have to somehow to decide which path you want to go. But the last sub-method is life cycle costing. As I mentioned, you look at the whole, whole life cycle of a product from the consumer perspective or from the purchaser perspective, and you'll find out it's worth spending more in a product if it lasts longer or if it saves energy. Um, when looking at eco-labels, uh, we have uh, developed quite a lot of uh, eco-labels for the Blue Angel uh, for energy consuming products such as computers, refrigerators, but also elevators, um, data centers, and everything. And uh, there is quite, uh, as I said, it's a multi-criteria label. It's not only the energy consumption, it's also the usability, noise emissions, the durability, the repairability of a product, but also the absence of hazardous uh, materials, uh, like poison, or, or materials that pose a risk to human health and the environment. Um, and looking at the end of products, uh, they have also to be 
uh, dismountable or recyclable, and there has to be adequate uh, user uh, consumer information. This is a campaign that was made by the uh, German Environmental Ministry or the yeah, Federal Ministry of Environment, uh, which says climate has a new guardian angel because we introduce quite a lot of climate related uh, projects. Mm. Last uh, assessment, uh, I, I have been talking about uh, product uh, sustainability assessment, PROSA, uh, but one more method uh, that actually I'm working on is the assessment of uh, energy efficiency of data centers. And this should be the motivation for you to look at these data centers that usually are quite invisible because they're some factory is filled with computers and we don't care, we just call it cloud computing or virtual anything. And we think it doesn't matter. But actually, this slide uh, shows the forecast of the year 2030, which says it, uh, everything uh, runs like expected. We will have 11% of the uh, worldwide electricity consumption only in the data centers. There is another 10% for the networks and the end consumer devices. So about 20% will be used only by uh, information technology. Uh, but the, the worst case, um, if you see at the growing of data uh, being transported over the networks, the worst case uh, will be 28% uh, of electricity consumption only by data centers. And if I look in the, the whole picture, also the networks and the end consumer devices, it will be 50% of the electricity consumption only for these things. And there are still quite uh, important other things that have to be uh, supplied with electricity. So either we shut down all the street lightning and aluminum uh, factories, or we build much more electricity plants in the future. Or we try to go this more sustainable way um, to reduce it somehow or not to grow as quickly as it really grows right now. Um, this is why we have introduced a methodology to count the energy efficiency of data centers uh, down to each uh, single appliance or each, each single server and data storage appliance and so on uh, to find out where are the weak points in data centers and the the different things uh, the different outcomes we have already uh, published is first thing a guide for green public procurement of energy efficient data centers uh, which is unfortunately only available in german uh, but uh, the Federal governments, in fact, buys his data center um, services according to this guideline. Um, then we developed uh, this key performance indicators for data centers, which is quite interesting. If you get an indicator, then you get something you can improve. So the ones that run the data centers, uh, they have to report to their, their management they can show these figures and show that they really have improved or that they are planning to improve anything. And the third thing I'm actually working on, which is not uh, yet published, is the environmental impact of cloud computing, uh, which should be a methodology um, counting really the environmental impact, for example, of one hour video streaming. We know looking TV not on the satellite or the, on the, the antenna, but streaming it over the internet produces about 40 grams of carbon dioxide every hour, which is not so much. But if you only consume uh, television over internet for hours a day, it's uh, 60 kilogram carbon dioxide every year. But this is only the, the, the network activity, and we want to look deeper also into the data centers themselves, or how much energy it consumes uh, to have um, one gigabyte of data stored in the data center, or anything. As I saw in the invitation for this event, there was a 
very big six megabyte attachment to this email. <laughs> it was also an environment impact of the size of the data attachments. <laughs> <laughs> that was it from my uh, place. And now I'd like to uh, discuss with you and your questions. Great, thanks a lot. <laughs> Six stuff. <laughs> 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 just uh, to make it more visible. <laughs> okay, so any questions? Yeah, I, I'd be interested in the um, product related policy in New Zealand uh, because, uh, for example, this eco label, I haven't really seen in the supermarkets and uh, this is at least the people I have been discussing with in uh, public procurement at least there doesn't seem to be um, uh, I don't know how, how the procurement works if it's only uh, always the cheapest product or if it's also uh, uh, some some that local companies are being supported or what are the policies of uh, procuring products will Pro, for example, New Zealand products will be preferred from Australian or Chinese products, or do you have any insights into the policy here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, all in your offices, your your purchasing paper, for example, uh, are you purchasing paper from recycled, uh, recycled uh, from old paper, maybe? Okay. It's pretty ad hoc. A lot of independence. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. It's not. So I guess you had a quite a sophisticated mm -hmm. range of, uh, of uh, policies, which were pushing, mm -hmm. pulling, etc. <laughs> um, I'd say take more than half of. Mm -hmm. would be New Zealand, and mm -hmm. seventy percent of those. Yeah, maybe um, so. We do uh, have a few mm -hmm. um, so labeling on energy efficiency of appliances, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But a lot of them, a lot of the things you described, we we don't have. Um, just um, do you see people, uh, companies trying to sort of manipulate to get the best label by even Maybe you said the better than average product mm -hmm. yes, uh, a sticker for them, mm -hmm. the worst one not. Could companies then produce five really inefficient machines mm -hmm. so that that drags the average down and mm -hmm. gets their better products? And, and <laughs> yeah, it, it's not this fragile the system. Uh, it, they are being revised the criteria every three years, and you look on the market what kind of products are there, and so it would useless for a company just to pull uh, bad products into the market to get this one sold better. The other thing is that they uh, don't take this label but they look at the criteria and they know what are the what is the best available or at least the expected best available uh, performance of products and they try you know, or give it to their engineers and say try to improve our products so they will view this kind of and in fact, there are also companies that don't really want to have this label because they say our company or the name of the company is much more valuable than this kind of uh, label that is competitive to others. Uh, but they really uh, they, they take part at the development uh, of the label criteria. So they try to, to hire the standards. And after all, they will not take it, but they will fulfill the criteria. Um, yeah, it's just some kind of uh, yeah, the policy of their their product or their marketing strategy. And on, on that point, it seems to rely, your policy mix seems to rely predominantly on market demand mm -hmm. and, its, and voluntary efforts by companies. What's your view on more legislation mm -hmm. and a stronger policy? Yeah. 
um, I really um, experienced that this eco design, which sets minimum standards, is in fact the really driver that drives the market. Yeah. There have been these old uh, bulbs with the which made more heat than than light which might be okay in a country that is heating with electricity in any way, but, <laughs> but um, they, as they have put this, uh, I've seen that on the, I don't know, this, no. Um, after they have put this um, energy scale uh, on these bulbs, these are the matte, the, the iced lamps, and these, uh, are quite uh, inefficient and this is the reason why you can't buy any more of these old bulbs in the uh, Eurozone only for certain purposes like in museums or whatever where they really need this special light uh, but this was the only reason why companies started uh, to produce LED lights or to, to in invest into the uh, better uh, better lights they wouldn't have done that if there wouldn't would have been no obligation to to uh, develop something else so in fact um, this is the the maybe the better thing but you can do both and you can uh, start softly and say we uh, we support companies with green public procurement or with anything better um, to make it better, uh, but uh, if there is a timetable that says in four or five years we'll cut off the worst products, it's quite yeah. um, I have a more philosophical approach, because, well, it's, I mean, all, all about the label. Mm -hmm. uh, the underlying idea of mm -hmm. uh, labeling with sustainability is that sustainability is something that you Rates, you know, and it's not like a, you know strong definition that something is sustainable, something is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, um, my my yeah, I don't know. I have I'm struggling with this idea, like, uh, which is like the main goal of the best label mm -hmm. in that sense. So could we kind of have a label that is says like this is hundred percent sustainable mm -hmm. because Closes all the material works mm. that, uh, to provide the, the utility. Yeah. And that, that right, um, right now, I like, like, like uh, the washing machine, for mm. the best washing machine, and it's A plus plus plus. Um, it is not causing the material work mm. to provide the utility. So, yeah. how can we, I mean, washing by hand, can, can, can it be real? Mm. Somehow, um, I'm, I'm kind of struck with this kind of But it can be compared with life cycle assessment, and you'll find yeah. out that you need much more hot water when washing by hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's less sustainable than washing with the dishwasher. This is what you'll find out with the uh, <laughs> with life cycle assessment. But your question was uh, can I only label uh, the very best products? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always this difficult if you try to do that because no product on the market will ever have this label and no consumer will be able to buy these kind of products. So we're going the other way, we're looking at the 20 to 30 percent of the best products mm -hmm. and after a certain period, three years maybe, uh, we sharpen the, the, uh, uh, the criteria or we lift the thresholds so we uh, the products must get better yes. um, in, in the example that you were asked uh, taking like the for instance a car mm -hmm. uh, if you have to uh, with your methodology you mm -hmm. have to assess uh, the cars in the car society and for instance one of the one of the mm -hmm. responses could be just walk that distance or yeah. buy so can we like set up like or do you provide any label that will kind of mm -hmm. answer this question? 
Yeah, this is in fact a weak point at this label that it always compares products uh, which are quite comparable or quite similar. And so if you compare cars, you can uh, you don't talk about deaf people in the traffic or about noise uh, or anything. You're just talking about the, the emissions or the consumption of fuel. So this is in fact a weak point, but there are other instruments to improve sustainable mobility and so on. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, it, we have in fact no uh, no blue angel or no eco label for bicycles because the label jury said uh, this is the independent commission that decides whether a label has to be developed or has to be given. They said bikes are environmental friendly in any way. We don't have to show them. We don't have to differentiate there is something. Yeah. yeah, and well, well like yeah. well, my, my only part is that it would be like very entertaining for people to have mm -hmm. like a label that they can, uh, uh, I mean, that they, they don't have like the best label mm -hmm. in the world, they don't have like, mm -hmm. just service or the other product that people can pay for. So it's just like no matter to have mm -hmm. like, a, like a, a label among all those, mm -hmm. saying that there's other um, alternatives. Mm -hmm. Oh, have another question. I'm from the um, food nutrition area, and so you know, we've been down along these front of pack food labels, mm -hmm. um, and so some of those have been thresholds, mm -hmm. uh, whether it appears or doesn't appear. And the research that I did into that really looked at maybe it was really companies that were healthier in nature mm -hmm. wanted to have that. So when it's voluntary in nature, mm -hmm. you get self selection of those that might be products on companies where they might be more into that that start that starts mm -hmm. appearing on. Their products, so it comes quite selectively, voluntarily. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you'd want something that's more mandatory in nature. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to use that threshold, the threshold has been quite useful. When you say we set it on the top third, and you have mm -hmm. threshold, it does move. Anyone wanting to get into that mm -hmm. threshold cutoff to, to move mm -hmm. up. Um, so I think you know, unfortunately, we've moved down to more of a, um, a health star rating system where it's more of a continuum, and we find mm -hmm. that people are gaming the system more because you can just do. This little bit extra over here mm. to kind of get a better number of stars, and and to the you know industry will gain the system to get the front of that label. Um, yeah. I guess my question is in regards to life cycle assessment. We're looking at the public procurement and food system, and um, how do you see that with the complexity of foods being foods within foods within foods? And mm. um, you know, um, I guess. How, uh, this would be an issue also if you were designing a computer where parts are coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that complexity, or do you just don't? You just come up with a, mm -hmm. a, a, a model? Yeah, uh, it, food is especially a very complicated uh, topic, and there is no eco label for food. There is only in Europe, there is a label for, for organic farming where you have to. You may not use uh, certain poisons and so on, uh, but this is for the process of manufacturing, and it's different to look at a product where you can the product you can put into into a laboratory and uh, look how much energy is consuming and so on. Uh, but if you are looking at food or, for example, at wood, you have to look at the whole production process. And there it's probably much better to have uh, instruments like um, um, yeah, management tools that they have to report frequently and they have to um, give education to the people that are employed and so on to improve the manufacturing. So it is not this easy to just put a label on it or just to prove if there are certain thresholds. Um, one interesting thing uh, concerning the, the move of the thresholds uh, was introduced in Japan, which is the top runner principle, where always the product that is the most sustainable sets the thresholds uh, for uh, after a certain time. And so every company tries to be the best because they set the minimum standard for the others. And if you get a certain time scale behind, I mean, this is other you problems. So it's achievable if <laughs> someone can actually yeah. make a product. Yeah. But uh, it's also if someone has invented a certain technique, uh, he's really fine because he can yeah. sell it or lend it to other people uh, 
they have to take it because otherwise their programs will be broken. So, so I have a question about your green procurement. Mm -hmm. is how hard is that analysis to do? I mean, can mm -hmm. we do it for the university mm -hmm. or the or for the need it? Yeah. I mean, is it? Uh, it's in fact an instrument that is a lot discussed and say we can reach a lot of goals with this instrument and you'll find in any uh, sustainability commitment yeah we can buy green uh, but in fact uh, it's but still voluntarily the numbers, yeah the numbers of how much you can save mm -hmm. that <laughs> those are the, the powerful ones you know you mm -hmm. can save greenhouse gas emissions and you can also save money mm -hmm. because those are powerful messages yeah, this is uh, so looking at different, uh, I don't know what they are all uh, purchasing, but it would be interesting where they're spending the most money or at least where, on the other hand, which instruments or which appliances consume much energy. And yeah. then, uh, so I was just wondering how big the study was, was it, did it, mm -hmm. did, is it the, uh, hard to do? This, um, I mean, if you once, found the systematic, uh, it's not so hard to recalculate that. Mm -hmm. And we had re re requests from other states that said to please calculate that for uh, Thüringen, for Sachsen, Anhalt or whatever. And we said we can give you the methodology, you can make it yourself because it's not really complicated. You have to know how, how long these products last, how much they're costing, how much energy they are consuming, and this, this was it already. Yeah, some products are more complicated as the printers that also consume paper, for <laughs> instance. But anyway, it's, um, this should be, um, yeah, usually should be part of a good management uh, in the procurement uh, department. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if there's no further questions, we might just stop there and mm -hmm. thank you very much again for that.